Well, hello everybody again. It's 2024. I can't believe it because I feel like I still live part of 2023. <laughs> I'm still in 2023, but happy new year to all of you. Now, welcome to the ninth webinar in the series uh, of the documentary. Well, the series following the documentary uh, titled Breastfeeding Not on the Agenda. I am Ernestine Gayunza. I'm the Associate Dean for Law and Police Studies here at York St. John University. I am the producer of the documentary titled Breastfeeding Not on the Agenda. And if you haven't watched it and you would like to watch it, please do check it out on YouTube. If you just type Breastfeeding Not on the Agenda, it will come. And it's under the same channel with all the webinars that we've been doing. So this is webinar nine. So one to eight is already there. Now, today I am delighted, beyond delighted actually, to welcome Dr. Wendy Jones. Now, Wendy is one of the founding members of UK charity, the Breastfeeding Network, having previously been an NCT breastfeeding counselor. In her employed life, Wendy was primary care pharmacist. She qualified as a pharmacist prescriber on primary prevention of coronary heart disease. Wendy left paid work 12 years ago to concentrate on writing her book or books and developing her website to provide information for mothers and professionals. Wendy is known for her work on providing a service on the compatibility of drugs in breast milk and has been a registered breastfeeding supporter for 36 years. Now that's a wealth of knowledge there. She is passionate that breastfeeding should be valued by all and that medication should not be a barrier. And I think we can all relate to this and also from the documentary when mothers were saying didn't know what to do and they didn't give us information. So when they handed over BFN drugs in breast milk service to a group of 11 other pharmacists in 2022, but continues to work by herself. Wendy was awarded MBA in the New Year's Honours list of 2018, well done Wendy, for services to mothers and babies. She received her award at Windsor Castle in May of 2019 from Her Majesty the Queen. Wendy has three daughters, and seven grandchildren, all of whom were proudly breastfed. She continues to work on her website, which is www.breastfeeding-and-medication.co.uk. We can send that information out to you if you would like to have it. And her web and her Facebook page, Breastfeeding and Medication, with no plans to retire anytime soon. Do not retire, Wendy. <laughs> so it's my absolute uh, pleasure to welcome Wendy and say, Wendy, over to you, please. Thank you very much, Ernestine. That you think about 37 years, it feels like such a lifetime. And it is a lifetime because it is um, the time that my youngest daughter has been born because I actually qualified as a breastfeeding counsellor whilst in hospital um, with preeclampsia because that's the kind of crazy thing that I do. Um, I can't sit still. My apologies for having to cancel um, this webinar back last August. Um, I had a, a peculiar bug and I was in bed with a mega high temperature and I'd lost my voice. So presenting was not going to be a very easy option and then between Ernestine and I we haven't had much chance to to record before now but hopefully we can still catch up. So I'm going to put this proviso out up front is that I'm going to use the term women mother as, and breastfeeding just because to keep swapping and changing confuses my aged brain um, but I'm recognizing that not all people who breastfeed or chest feed advance as uh, identify as women and I did pinch this because I think this is so beautifully phrased um, from the Lancet series. So one of the things that I 
believe will change the story about drugs in breast milk was the setting up of the Safer Medicines Con Consortium. That's quite a few years ago now, but it was a consortium that was set up by the Medicines Health Regulatory Authority who control the licensing of all of the drugs. But they were keen that all pregnant and breastfeeding women should be able to make their own informed decisions. So they brought together um, the great and the good, the regulators and the NHS, together with the leading third sector charities and tried to make a consensus of how we take information forwards. We know that many expectant mums and breastfeeding mums do need to take medication because there's a lot of chronic diseases around in our society, possibly because we're better at identifying them, possibly because back when I started, a lot of women with chronic diseases were told they couldn't have children. So the, the uh, discussion never arose. But I have already seen changes in the wor the wording of the BNF, the standard book that all doctors, pharmacists, nurses, and everybody else use uh, about um, the way drugs can be used. So they, they now is wording like according to expert consensus, which is something I've dreamt about for more years than I care to imagine. But why is breastfeeding medication such a problem? Sadly, breastfeeding was never on the undergraduate curriculum of most healthcare professionals. It certainly wasn't on mine. I had the great pleasure about 10 years ago of doing a, a one hour lecture to second year students uh, at Portsmouth University. Um, but that was a great space to tell them stories so that as they went into their professions, they remembered breastfeeding is important. So I asked them things like, do you know how many extra calories there are uh, consumed by a formula fed baby compared with a breastfed baby? But when I undertook my PhD, I looked at a lot of how medics of all shapes and sizes came to have their information. Now, in some cases, they had mentors who were very pro-breastfeeding and provided uh, evidence-based information. But there were many whose information was based on attitudes or how they fed their own children. Now, breastfeeding supporters, counsellors, all of those who are of us who are peer supporters have a chance to debrief our experiences, but most medics don't. So if they didn't meet their own breastfeeding goals, they may well come out with a view that breastfeeding is really difficult. It causes people to be um, stressed. It makes them feel depressed without actually having the time or the knowledge base to look about the evidence. So that's what I've been doing for the last, um, I think I started this in 1985, which is probably more years ago than many of you have been born. But I question in any other area of medicine, do we provide information burst up based on our personal experience rather than looking at evidence. Say I have high blood pressure. Do I go and look at the evidence base around the various drugs or do I say, well, my aunt Susie didn't like that drug. It gave her hot flushes, so I won't prescribe that. I found that drug really difficult to use or I like that one best. I saw a rep last week who told me this drug was really brilliant or I went to a presentation or it was in my professional magazine. This is the kind of thing we come up against in breastfeeding and medication. And I think for professionals, it's very difficult to say they actually don't know the answer. It's in a a realm of life that they haven't had experience and they don't have the time to look it up. 
when I uh, was an independent prescriber, I took 20 minutes to look at lifestyle advice for professionals. Most doctors have seven minutes to welcome their patient, listen to their story, record what is being said, issue a prescription and get the person out of the door. They don't have time to look up what is the answer of if the mother is breastfeeding. And that's how the fact sheets in BFN and on breastfeeding mid came to about. I thought if a question is asked more than twice, lots more people probably need to know the answer. And I originally set about writing them for mothers, but actually I think they've become very useful for professionals because they're written in a style that provides the evidence without too many words around it so that you've got time to look up. But for mothers who are breastfeeding and needing to take a, me a medication, there's so much guilt and baggage. What if this drug gets through to my baby? I might poison my baby. I've been involved in a discussion on a social media forum this weekend where a mother was feeding a four-year-old and um, needed an antibiotic and was told the antibiotic would damage her child. And it seemed that no matter how many people said, I've used this drug and my children are fine, or the evidence that I said, the baggage on her back was, but what if my child is different? Can I live with the guilt if I damage their child? But then there's the other side was, I might poison my baby if I give it formula. I've breastfed for so long, it's the gold standard. If they've got a chronic disease, if they don't breastfeed, are they not as good a mum? Are they not a good mum because they're depressed? If I've got breastfeeding problems, why is it everybody else seems to manage so much better than me? I'm rubbish at everything, which possibly is where the link with depression comes in. And I'll come back to that later. And sharing things on social media we all know everybody's lives look so much better than ours because we only pick post the instagram precious moments so when i asked uh, the mums on my facebook page what did they want to say about drugs in breast milk one thing that came up repeatedly was they were fed up on the advice that breastfeeding didn't matter, particularly if the baby was older, and or that they couldn't be prescribed a medication unless they stopped breastfeeding, whether they wanted to or not. And they just wanted somebody to listen to them and provide them with the information, just as we set out with a consortium to say, this is the information in a format that you can understand at this moment. And the last one that was really saddened me is somebody diagnosed with cancer, just being told that she needed to stop breastfeeding, not given any other options, not given any information. And all she needed was to understand how much of the drug got through, whether she could feed again in the future, just to be part of that informed decision. A lot about prescribing during breastfeeding comes back to the potential risks of, breast, of medication in pregnancy. And we all know about the risk of thalidomide. It's kind of something that's haunted us for generations. They thought it was very safe. They sold it over the counter for nausea in pregnancy. But there were over 10,000 adverse events worldwide and 50% of the babies died and that's coloured all of our decision making and we lump pregnancy and breastfeeding together. We still have the tragedy of mums being prescribed val sodium valproate to treat either bipolar or epilepsy and are still reporting birth defects. There is a huge protocol about how they shouldn't ever be given to women of childbearing age without full information. But pregnancies aren't always planned and accidents happen. 
But when we're looking at medicines in pregnancy, we also have to remember that one in five pregnancies ends in a miscarriage and three in every hundred babies will have a birth defect with or without medication. That's a background risk, like the background risk of crossing the road. 99.999 times we can cross the road and it won't do us any harm just that very small percentage. But again, women need to make have the information to make their own choices. And we know that women's experience is that if they are taking medication, often they will choose either not to take the medication and carry on breastfeeding, to stop breastfeeding, or to carry on breastfeeding and take the medication. And this came out in my own uh, research. But the people who are formula feeding are more likely to take something. But I had a woman recently emailed me and going, my baby is 23 months old. I desperately want to feed for 24 months. I've got to, I want to get to the two years, but I ne need some paracetamol for a headache. And I said, you've not taken any paracetamol? Said, no, no, I'm desperate to keep my milk as pure as possible for my baby. I haven't taken anything since the day I found out I was pregnant. Now that takes a lot of commitment to find a natural remedy, to be so certain that you're doing the best for your baby. But we actually give more than half of newly delivered mums some kind of medication in the first five days after delivery and quite rightly so we we need to give them painkillers we need might need antibiotics um when i started out the first thing that i was asked to do was address the prescription of sleeping tablets because in tower hamlets at that time this is back in the early 80s babies were taken away from their mothers and kept in a nursery from the first day out after delivery. And that was standard. That happened with my eldest daughter as well. But of course, the mums couldn't sleep. They were lying awake, listening for their baby. Was their baby being looked after? Did their baby need a cuddle? And I was want my baby. But what was happening? They were given sleeping tablets instead. So they were less of a problem to the staff whilst the babies were formula fed overnight. So, but that is what started me on this long journey. So, as I said, we often put breastfeeding and pregnancy together. But back in 2003, which doesn't feel that very long ago to me, Phil Anderson looked at all the adverse events that had been reported about drugs in breastfeeding. And he wrote this paper that you can access online and looked at how many of them were actually definitely linked with the drug that the mother was taking. There were very few that were very definitely linked to the drugs. There so in, fa in fact, there were none. 47 were probably due, 53 possibly due. CNS depressants, things like sleeping tablets, tranquilizers, anything that would make the mother drowsy accounted for more than half the re uh, reports. Anything side effect that the mum may experience is possibly going to happen to the baby. So for most of us, when we take antibiotics, we get runny bowel motions. So it's unsurprising that the babies tend to get runny nappies. Anything that is going to make us sleepy is likely to make the baby sleepy. But we can avoid those or if we know that the baby's going to have diarrhea, we just accept it and it will go away. But then when I was reading the report, I got to three reported facilities and I thought, oh, do I want to do this job anymore? Shall I just go back to my paid work? Shall I take the easy route? 
But in actual fact, most of them had exten- all had extenuating circumstances. So one was to where a mother had been using methadone in high doses, but the baby actually hadn't died from methadone p- poisoning. It was being neglected. And it was very obvious at post-mortem that this was a cause. In another case, a mum had been given phenobarbitone to treat her epilepsy. And this goes very much through into breast milk. And the baby had already had a near miss um, cot death and died of a cot death. And for the life of me at this second, I can't remember what the third case was. But the most important thing was that most of the reported cases that were adverse events were in youngest babies. Now, babies in the first six weeks of their life aren't able to metabolize drugs as well as they can after that because their liver and their kidneys are not fully functioning. So a drug may have a longer half-life, may stay in the infant's body longer at that stage and cause side effects than it is later on. But I'm sure all the girls who, and there are now more of them running the Drugs in Breast Milk helpline as well, will agree that most of the queries we get are about older babies, older than six months, where their mum's wishes to breastfeed are being discounted. The patient information leaflet. I never read the patient information leaflet that's in every book, every box, but then I'm a pharmacist. I should know that information anyway. But if you read what is in those leaflets in virtually every packet that there is, it says something like, don't take this drug if you're breastfeeding. Ask a professional before you take this if you're breastfeeding. And that will often stop a woman from either taking the drug or of breastfeeding. She's making that decision that's right for her. But doing my research, it came out very strongly that the written word is stronger than the spoken word. So one mum who responded to my research said, I asked the pharmacist if this was okay to take when I was breastfeeding, and he said yes, but the leaflet said no, so I thought he was wrong. And that saddened me because that's about a relationship. But if it's somebody that you've never met before, why would you trust them? I often think with all the number of emails and and phone calls that I answered over the years, why were people trusting me? They didn't know who I was. Um, That's a huge level of commitment. But I hope the answer was that I was giving it in a way that they made sense to them. So the patient information leaflets are often negative. And the reason they're there is that the manufacturers are not required to take responsibility when they first market a drug. We can't do clinical trials on brand new drugs on a breastfed baby. Who, which one of us would want to expose our baby to a drug where we didn't know what was going to happen and maybe don't know much about the way the drug is handled in the body? But even when the drugs have been marketed for years and years and years and we know so much about them, the leaflet will not be changed. And that's something that I hope the consortium will get round to changing um, in fullness of time. The Americans have been trying to change it for several years. And the companies have worked against it because there is a cost implication. And by the time that there is enough research out, most of the drugs are being made generically by other companies and there is no profit for them. So just like the high cost of formula at the moment, it's about economics and it's about responsibility. Pregnant women are able to name the benefits of breastfeeding and so too are healthcare professionals. But then as soon as we add a drug in, we're just not sure that everything is the same. So when I was first writing up my PhD, I found, which I didn't do till I was in my 50s, I was a very late developer. Um, I found something called a polarity map. And this 
is just a simple grid that we can fill in. So if we want, if the mother wants to continue breastfeeding, we know that there are ongoing advantages of breast milk production, both for the mum and the baby. And it may be that the baby doesn't want to take a bottle anyway. It isn't the same as breastfeeding. If we stop them, the drug won't go to the baby. And we don't, as prescribers, don't have to take pro professional responsibility against what's in the leaflet. And we know that the baby will be safe from the drug. But if you look at the other side, we're denying the mother's wish to continue to breastfeed. And we're taking away the advantages of breastfeeding from the mother and the baby. And we're changing that feeding method. And I've come across babies who have gone for 12, 24 hours screaming the place down because they didn't want to suck from a bottle. And on social media, there are people saying, is there a different bottle? Is there a different teat? Do I need to warm it up? Do I need to cool it down? Does somebody else need to do it? It's just the baby knows that what it wants is the breast. And breast milk isn't just about nutrition. It's about so much more. But if we let this mum continue to breastfeed, there's a little bit of the drug going through to the baby. And as the prescriber, we are now taking responsibility for the prescription of the drug and are we sure we're not going to harm the baby and that's a lot to ask but actually we can go away and look at expert sources which are not in the standard books that we have in our desk um, and fill in those boxes with the mother and say where do you want this decision to lie what is right for you and it's about sh shared decision making. And in some cases, women aren't even well. I hope you can't hear my dogs barking. They have just seen something down the right of the topic. Um, it, again, it came up in my research that many women weren't ever asked by the professionals whether they were breastfeeding or not. And it was often just assumed that they were bottle feeding once the babies had got to um, six weeks, three months. But we do know that sadly many women will have stopped by that time. And the women are left dissatisfied because they weren't involved in that decision making process. And they'll often come out with words like, I'm not allowed to. Well, being allowed to do anything when it's your baby, to me, is quite difficult because I want to make this decision that's right for me. But sadly, we don't have the large randomized control trials about passage of drugs into breast milk. We may have information about 20 women who have been exposed to this drug and how what's happened to their babies. But that's the way it is. We have to accept what we've got. Because people don't publish something when nothing exciting happened. If I get, prescribe a drug and the mother is fine and the baby is fine, why would I want to write a paper which is going to take me hours, submit it through a journal and go through all the process that that takes, find the funding to publish in that journal? It's not worth the effort. So we get a bias, a publication bias, because the information isn't there. So I think that we need to tell mums where there are any potential risks from the drug. So an example would be codeine, where there has been one baby death in Canada from where the mother's body concentrated the drug in her breast milk when does she need to actually highlight that or something like antibiotics producing a loose bowel motion so she needs to know what she's looking out for and decide what's right for her but she also needs to be reassured that breastfeeding has so many benefits so if we're very happy that this drug is compatible with breastfeeding she can go and address any negative comments that come from other members of her family.
Many times I've seen um, husbands say, but are you sure you heard the doctor correctly? And mother-in-law who only formula fed her baby saying, do you know what? I don't think that that's that's right. I think you should be formula feeding. If you're feeling ill, I'll take the baby away and I'll give you a rest. But she also needs to know if she stops breastfeeding, when can she start again and how does she maintain her supply? And NICE, the National Institute for Clinical Excellence, have written a whole guideline on shared uh, decision making. But when I last looked, it didn't have breastfeeding and medication in there. So a few examples of this that uh, I've come across over the years. Um, I spoke to a lady just after Easter. She'd gone to her dentist uh, the day before Good Friday and he'd prescribed her antibiotics and said she couldn't breastfeed. But she was in so much pain, she had to take the antibiotics. But nobody had told her how to maintain her milk supply. And by the following week when she contacted me, her milk supply had diminished dramatically. She was de very desperate to go bre back to breastfeeding, but then had to re-stimulate her milk supply. Actually, she was very lucky that she didn't develop mastitis in the process because she wasn't removing any milk. But actually, with the antibiotic was metronidazole and she need never have stopped. But she was left angry and disempowered by this dentist who hadn't had any training about breastfeeding um, and just told her to stop. Social media talks a lot about um, dentists telling people that their, their children's dental decay is due to them breastfeeding long term. Breastfe breastfeeding takes milk right over the back of the back of your tongue, doesn't pull in your mouth and there is no evidence. And in this case, the mum tried to argue her point and say, no, 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 this, this isn't true. And the healthcare professional brought up a website from Toppy Tippy as evidence-based information on how to advise um, the mother. There are government recommendations and information sheets. Um, a lot of dental decay is down to pregnancy and possibly uh, be the mother being ill in pregnancy and just a lack of calcium being laid down. Another mum contacted me and said my baby is, oh, it's, no she actually contacted a health visitor, um, baby's three weeks old and she wanted some medication to dry up her milk. Um, she has severe hay fever and was told by the local pharmacist she could take anything unless she stopped breastfeeding. And and if you've had hay fever, it's pretty miserable. So she decided breastfeeding had to go. She needed her medication. But actually, there are loads of treatments for breastfeeding. Loratadine we give to children at the age of two in just half the dose that we give to an adult. So if a two-year-old could take half a, do a dose, the amount getting through it in breast milk is infinitesimally small and that trying to dry up her milk has lots of side effects too. So she was losing in both cases. Pharmacists can also um, be detrimental because they may set, give the impression that, no, they are the experts in drugs in, in breast, drugs and generally, but we can also provide different information to what the doctors provided. So the mum's got a doctor saying something, but maybe the pharmacist refusing to dispense the prescription because they don't think it's compatible with breastfeeding and they're not going to take the responsibility. So the mum has to go back. And there are lots of over-the-counter remedies which are perfectly safe for women to take and use when they're breastfeeding. So things like head lice treatments, vaginal thrush, threadworms, um, and all of these can be taken during breastfeeding. All of these kind of joys of motherhood, you know, the September -oct time for the time when you suddenly realize your child's uh, scratching its head, it's probably got head lice, scratching its bottom, you've picked up the threadworms from the Play-Doh. Professionals often overdiagnose um, what could be a breastfeeding issue. 
So they might say um, insufficient milk. But rather than referring to somebody who knows and understands about how breastfeeding works and how to treat this, they may prescribe a drug. Thrush, the mum has got painful nipples. Oh, I don't, I can't, I don't know how to solve that. Um, I've heard there's a, there's a tablet that you can take that sorts out sore nipples. No, the mum needs some basic um, information and some active listening skills. And the same is true for a cow's milk protein intolerance, reflux and colic. If you've got seven minutes, it's easier to write a prescription, but it's even easier to refer to somebody who can check in and assess the breastfeeding and support the mother long term. Perinatal mental health is a continuum. We're all somewhere on that continuum and that can vary from day to day. And having a new baby is a very stressful time. It may be nothing to do with breastfeeding. It may be that you actually struggle with sleep. Or it can be this being hyperprotective of your baby that just sends your adrenaline level up. But many women are embarrassed and actually don't tell people that they are anxious or depressed because they're frightened of being told that they need to stop breastfeeding or that breastfeeding is going to be blamed when actually it may be the only positive thing in their lives. Um, if your child is under 12 months, you should have priority to access the talking therapies, but you will usually have to leave your baby somewhere else. Now, I'd love it if in all of these settings, there was a healthcare support worker who sat in the room outside and looked after your baby whilst you concentrated on your mental health needs. Because my daughter, who is a CBT therapist, said if the baby is in the room, if the baby's cooing and happy, you're both focused on responding to the baby. If the baby's crying, you're both responding to the baby. And babies don't always lie still for an hour. So that's the reason. It's nothing about, as somebody once said, I was told if I cried in my CBT therapy, it would harm the baby's mental health for life. Rubbish. But in this Maternal Health Alliance report, one of the things that absolutely breaks my heart is that people are worried they may be seen as a not good enough mother and that somebody might take their baby away and into care. It's not true. We're all there to help. And there are many, many antidepressants that you can take and breastfeed quite safely. For some people, breastfeeding is the only thing that they can feel positive about. Um, one of my daughters told me that she was told, if you're anxious, just go running. I, my breasts are full of milk. My baby needs feeding every hour. How the heck do you think I'm going to find time to go running? And anyway, I don't like running. That's not helping. It's about finding your own way through your capacity. And stopping breastfeeding can make things significantly worse because you're losing the power of oxytocin, which is this calming effect. This one lady, I, I feel like I'm always criticizing professionals, actually said how wonderful this nurse practitioner was because she really understood about what breastfeeding was like and how to prescribe and support the mum. And this mum left feeling that somebody else was fighting her corner. I want to clone people like that. But this person was very unsupportive. Um, how far along are you in your breastfeeding journey? What, two years and three months? Well, there's absolutely no benefit. You need to stop that straight away. How many times have we all heard that conversation? It, you're doing it for your own benefit. You're making a rod for your own back. Actually, I don't want your opinion on my breastfeeding. That's my business, not your business. Just think about treating me. Empower me. Praise me for being a good mother, trying my hardest to do my best. 
it does breastfeeding isn't just about bonding and colostrum it's about so so much more it's about pain relief when you're having an injection there are so many times when we can interact with professionals when they can be positive stop look listen and be positive this is a story I used to tell a long time ago. I actually had to stop because too many members of the audience would end up crying. But I think this is an example. So Susan has a six week old baby and she's going for her six week check. But she hasn't had much sleep recently and she's feeling a bit low. And she goes to see her doctor that she's known since she was a child. And he says, hello, Susan, what a lovely baby. How are you doing? And you know, sometimes when somebody is being really nice to you, your emotions just bubble over. And Susan starts crying. And he says, oh, dear, 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 uh, this isn't like you. You were normally such a happy person. Um, I'm going to prescribe you some antidepressants. But he looks in his, his, his book and he sees that it says this antidepressant is not compatible with breastfeeding. And so he tells her that she needs to stop breastfeeding. And she goes home where she's got her prescription in her hand and, and she goes to the pharmacy. And the lady at the counter said, oh, yeah, uh, I tried breastfeeding. It wasn't for me. Um, formula is really good, you know. Um, you can hand the baby over to somebody else. And she gets the pump and, and, and the bottles and the sterilizer and everything else ready. And Susan actually hasn't got enough money to pay for all this, but she puts it on her credit card and she'll worry about that later. And the pharmacist sees the formula on the desk and he doesn't mention breastfeeding. But when, when she gets home, she gives her baby one last feed and the baby reaches up, puts her hand across the breast and tears roll down Susan's face because feeding her baby was the thing that really, really mattered to her and was going well. And she puts the baby down in the cot, makes up the bottle of formula ready for next time. And when she gets the baby up, the baby's going, what is this thing in my mouth? I don't want this. Mum, I can smell your milk because the milk's dripping because Susan's hearing the baby cry. And they sit there and they both sob. And Susan's partner comes home and Susan thrusts the baby away and says, you're going to have to deal with this. I'm not allowed to breastfeed anymore. And her partner thinks... This morning, she was just a little bit tired. Where has this all gone wrong? And Susan meets the health visitor the following day for some help in trying to dry up her milk. And the health visitor looks at her and she's sad too because she knew how much breastfeeding had meant to Susan. And she sighs and goes along to the doctor to try and educate her so that nothing like this happens again. And I think this is a story that we can probably all identify with. I've mentioned Lyme disease before, so I'm not going to go, go through this because I want to leave some time um, for some questions. Professionals and nipple pain, don't just prescribe a cream. Don't just say breastfeeding doesn't matter. Send the mum to somebody who does understand and don't just assume it's thrush and all that all breastfeeding hurts because that's not true. Nipple pain affects the whole family. It makes mum anxious. It makes dad anxious because he's desperately trying to protect her and it disempowers everybody. They're left feeling helpless because all they can do is watch their partner suffer. I have a condition called inflammatory bowel disease and I run a Facebook page for breastfeeding mums with IBD. And they uh, arranged to have an article printed in the Crohn's and Colitis magazine and it won an award against magazines like Beano. And what everybody liked best was not only that it showed breastfeeding on the cover, but it showed breastfeeding an only baby, older baby. And 
those of us who have IBD know that actually breastfeeding helps to protect our own children from developing it. So it's vital for us. But all over the world, women are told the same thing. You're having a um, colonoscopy tomorrow. You're having bowel preparation. We're giving you this medication. You can't breastfeed. And it's not true. Very few cases. Women want medics to understand that breastfeeding matters, that it might not have been a simple journey until they get to see the professional on that day. But they also want professionals to look at evidence-based sources of information and not just to rely on the standard book or the computer program in their, on their desks. Um, they want to know that their breastfeeding is acknowledged and valued. I've spent a lot of time uh, developing information about how to understand the pharmacokinetics, um, the way that drugs are handled in the body. It's actually not nearly as complicated as even I thought when I was writing up my PhD. I said to my supervisor, don't make me write about that. That's complicated stuff. I can't do that. Now I spend my whole life doing it and trying to teach it in a way where I talk about things like Lego bricks and sieves because it doesn't have to be complicated. Even, even how dare I say it, mothers can understand this as well, so they can be part of the discussions. And if we don't have trials, sometimes we can understand how much drug will get through to breast milk just by understanding how the body handles it. I hate the words pumping and dumping breast milk because it makes them sound like the milk has no value whatsoever. Um, if a doctor ever, or a pharmacist or a nurse ever says pump and dump, all I want to say is don't throw it away too quickly. Go and find out if there's something else that you can do with the milk, even if it's only put it in the bath or Maybe that first decision of you need to pump and dump is incorrect. We do not want to waste one precious drop of breast milk. There are guidelines, national guidelines on looking for um, specialist sources, but nobody ever seems to look at them. Uh, they did try to update them and take this out, but um, so far to my knowledge, it's still in there. In trying to do no harm by not prescribing a drug during breastfeeding, we may actually cause harm. So we may cause mastitis in the mum who isn't told how to express or who maybe can't express. We may be stopping a baby breastfeeding uh, who doesn't want to take formula or becomes intolerant. And we're dropping the milk supply that takes us so much work to re-stimulate it. Breast milk is not a tap. We can't turn it on and off. This is a, sh a slide of my eldest grandson, um, who was in hospital in America while his dad had stage four bowel cancer when he was just three months old. But throughout all the stay in hospital and my son-in-law's subsequent death, my daughter was able to continue a full milk supply. And we thought that this was probably because of the amount of oxytocin. If you look in that room, the amount of love between those three adults and that child that's going round and round and round and supporting mothers. Breast milk, oxytocin affect us in so many different ways. But while we're on the subject of cancer, I want to actually also raise something that I've never ever shared before or said before, is that although breast milk protects against cancers, don't assume, as I and a member of my family have done, that if you have breastfed, you won't get breast cancer. Because this person left it a little bit too long and it had spread despite the fact that she had breastfed for seven years. So please, ladies, still remember to examine your breasts. Enjoy every moment of breastfeeding. 
But remember, it's about relative risks, not absolute risks. But to end on a positive note, there are many negative comments about social media, um, about um, how breastfeeding doesn't work. And this lady went and saw her doctor and he said, you mustn't stop breastfeeding. It's recommended until at least two years. Being a health care professional at the moment, post pandemic, with all the things that are going on in the world is very hard. And to, to criticise is all too easy. Sometimes we as mothers need to praise our professionals from being brilliant. And sometimes the professionals need to recognise how hard we're working to do the best that we can. And that above all, medication don't mean you need to stop breastfeeding. We can use pharmacokinetics, we can use specialist resources, we can support mums with expressing, and we can all work together as breastfeeding experts to let a mum do what she wants to do with full information. These are just a few of the information sources that I use, um, and three out of the four of them are free to access. So as I say, the BFN fact sheets and my breastfeeding medication ones, if I've asked the question twice, there will be a fact sheet. There are a couple of books up there, and I think every hospital and surgery in the country should have the guide to supporting breastfeeding for the medical professionals, because it's been written by a group of incredible friends, many of whom have presented as part of this webinar series. We need to use evidence-based sources. If it matters to you, that you find out whether a drug is compatible to, to me. It matters to those of the girls who still run the Drugs in Breast Milk Helpline, and it matters to me. Please email us for information. The slides will all be sent out to you, minus a few of the pictures, because that will just waste your ink cartridges. Um, but if you want to ask a question, I'm never very far away. Thank you for listening. Please share all this information with everybody you meet. Thanks. Well, Wendy, thank you so, so much. I mean, there's so much in there um, that I it just made me, it reminded me of my own personal circumstances because when I had my first daughter, um, I had a C-section that went wrong somehow. And they said, you need to stop breastfeeding because you need, uh, stronger painkillers and you cannot breastfeed and I didn't want to give up breastfeed but the only reason why I stayed on breastfeeding was because my daughter absolutely refused all the formula they brought <laughs> they brought all the different brands they brought all the different bottles and teats and everything and after trying for about a month they said to me there you go it's your daughter she's as stubborn as you good luck with it and I was left with her but for me, although I was really at that point didn't know anything at all and that there was an issue about me, what do I do? There was an issue about my daughter, but it worked out for me just because my daughter was stubborn, really stubborn. But I can see from my kids that there will be many, many mothers in that circumstances. The documentary um, also highlighted a mother who was talking about she had epilepsy and she didn't know whether there will be any um, impact and she was asking for information they didn't give it to her until she made her decision to start breastfeeding before the information came so I can see that many will be in this position so this is really really valuable information you're doing a great job thank you yeah. What I makes can... me sad is people have been pregnant for nine months why have, have these discussions not been had much earlier on yeah, I know. It's interesting. Um, we've got some questions and time is running fast. So the first <laughs> one, <laughs> the first one is asking about, is there any medical evidence to support IVF clinics rejecting breastfeeding patients? 
having looked at most of the IVF drugs many times over the years, it's a fact sheet I keep meaning to write, but it's so complicated because everybody's regime is different. There is only one drug mm. that is potentially a problem. Many people get pregnant whilst they're still breastfeeding. Many clinics now do accept ongoing breastfeeding um, as not being an, an issue. I think in the past it was a bit about, well, we want to ma uh, make sure your choices are as, as high as possible of conceiving. But what's the difference between why are we making people who need IVF feel different just because they need a bit of help? Good question. Very good question. Thank you. And another one, um, is there a credible information source about periods and breastfeeding? It seems to be a huge unknown gray area. I recently went to a GP as I haven't had periods for over two years and I was instructed to give up breastfeeding completely and for six months until they could even begin to look into it. Again, it's one of these things of trying to control the mother's body again um, the t the time when periods return varies so dramatically and i know there are many people who are desperate to conceive again because they want a small gap or age isn't on their side um but again you could conceive before you've had a period and you can't to doing hormone tests when you're breastfeeding is quite difficult because nobody knows what your baseline is. Um, so they're trying to, to lower hormones. But if it's what you and your baby want, it's your decision. And I, I'm not aware of any major studies. It's, it's pretty much it's anecdote between women. Breastfeeding mm -hmm. sadly has few medical pieces of good research because who funds it so true thank you um another one so what's your view of what's your view of medication used to induce lactation in people e.g granny breastfeeding while the mother goes back to work and if that is fine then how about inducing breastfeeding in men i can't see any evidence of safety studies having been done there are some studies about um, breastfeeding being milk production being um, induced in men, um, but it's very, very limited. And the amount of milk that was able to be produced was not an exclusive breastfeeding and it ceased very early. I know anecdotally in other countries, um, underdeveloped countries, um, grandmas did breastfeed if there was no other option. Um, Using drugs to do that always concerns me because particularly domperidone, you need very high doses of it. And although very little gets through in breast milk, there are now uh, increasing number of reports of it causing depression and almost psychosis. Um, so it's a huge complicated area that's probably worthy of a whole webinar in itself. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we've got less than a minute to go. There's just one question. Let's see if we can manage that quite quickly if this doesn't cut us off. Um, do you have any view on lithium and breastfeeding? Some resources say no, others say yes. Lithium has always been one drug that we have thought um, caused problems. It needs the baby to be monitored and many paediatricians weren't willing to monitor the baby so that the mother could have it. That's starting to change. But the baby would need the same blood test as you do. Right. Thank you so much, Wendy. There's been a lot of messages there um, all talking about thank you, well-deserved, great information, great insights, and I echo that. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you to everybody who joined us in this webinar. It's being recorded, so um, the link will be going out soon with Wendy's uh, slides. So if you don't receive it, which I'm sure you will do, please just feel free to get in touch. But Wendy, thank you so, so much for this. You're doing an incredible job. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. And I'll answer you all of your questions. <laughs> Thanks a lot. And bye now.
Bye. Bye.